Hi, this is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio, and it is my delight to have Diane DeResta as my guest today. Diane is a communications expert, but I want to set the stage a little bit for the program that we're going to be doing. Uh, about two weeks ago, I was uh, invited to be the opening keynote speaker for an association conference, and they said, well, if you're going to be in the night before, why don't you attend our board meeting and, and dinner that follows? And yeah, I was there in plenty of time, so I said, sure, why not? thought, you know, good an opportunity to meet some of the board members and to find out a bit more about the association. Well, in the process of doing that, there were three presenters. First one did a pretty decent job. The second one really was, was quite good. But the third fellow that presented, well, it was, um, it was challenging. I was, I was cringing in the back of the room because it was just so bad. And, uh, and it occurred to me that, that some people really are challenged when it comes to spoken communication. And that's the forte of my guest. Diane DeResta is a certified speaking professional. She is the founder and CEO of DeResta Communications, a New York City consultancy serving business leaders who deliver high stake presentations, whether it is one to one or in front of a crowd or from an electronic platform. She is the author of this great book called Knockout Presentations, How to Deliver Your Message with Power, Punch, and Pizzazz, an Amazon category bestseller, and it happens to be widely used as a text in college business communication courses, and plus, she is the author of an ebook, which I love the title of, Give Fear the Finger. And now, you can find that at Deresta.com, and that is D-I-R- ESTA.com. Let me say that again, Deresta, D-I-R-E-S-T-A.com. She has a unique ability to get to the core of the message and translate complexity into simplicity. And Diana, I, I'm thrilled to have you on the show today. Uh, simplicity is probably the word for what we need to be talking about on the radio, although many of the folks will see this uh, on YouTube. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Well, tell us a little bit about some of the, let's start with some of the experiences that you've had, because it has to be fascinating to work with people who probably don't find talking in, as a normal thing for them, or at least comfortably communicating as normal. Absolutely. It is one of the top few me for two major reasons. Although I do a lot of work in the area of executive presence with corporate executives and leaders, it comes down to two things. It's either fear or getting to the point, knowing how to structure your message. And it has to do with fear. But what I do is I work with senior level executives and women leaders who, have, who want to influence their constituents in high stakes situations. So in a I worked with the CEO of a vaccine company, and he was trying to convince the executive committee to fund a $300 million facility overseas. There was a success, three-year clinical trial, and I worked with him on getting that message across, on crafting and presenting and influencing. He was successful, and that facility ended up being a $1 billion profit. So it was really successful. So a lot of people don't realize there is truly an ROI, a return on investment when you present yourself well, because it's all about influence. People who have good speaking skills, good presentation skills, get better jobs, they get higher salary funding, they get the credibility, they get the, the plum assignments. So it behooves all of us because if you're an entrepreneur, especially, and you're not using speaking to market yourself, you're leaving money on the table because this is one of the most cost-effective and powerful marketing strategies, and it's so underutilized. And when it is un when it is utilized, it's not done well. I can give you a quick example. Sure. Is a vendor who was giving a free seminar, and I'm not going to tell you what the topic was, but I was interested. Well, from the get-go, he was so monotone. And then his second slide was all text. It was a paragraph. And then he started with the product. And 
the person who was the sponsor sent an email later and said, well, what did you think? Give us feedback. And I said, honestly, I clicked out after slide three. And my husband happened to walk in the room and he didn't say anything, but he heard it and he thought, uh, is that a client she's coaching? Poor Diane. How is she going to work with that? And I said, no, it was the vendor. It turned out he was the VP. VP of sales, Chuck. It was oh, no. unbelievable. VP of sales. So here would be my advice. If I were to work with a person, I would either try to work with them so that they were more effective, or I would say, just because you're the VP of sales doesn't mean you have to be the presenter of the webinar. Put your best people there. And especially when you are going for funding, when you are pitching VCs or angel investors, it doesn't always have to be the CEO who's doing most of the talking. Put your best presenter forward. But more importantly, invest in yourself so you become that best best presenter. Diane, in your in, in the world that you work in, you you really you have to come across all types. Mm -hmm. um, you said a moment ago that um, you know you work with high stakes uh, uh, CEOs, VPs, people who are are uh, uh, pitching major. Uh, uh, programs that they want to get funded, et cetera. You also said you work um, um, with with women. I have an interesting question. Do you find there is a difference in a, a person, a human being's ability to communicate? Is it easier for men than women? Does it make a difference? What's your experience? I don't believe that men or, wi or women are better at speaking. And I used to joke that there are two equal and money and public speaking because <laughs> people the fear factor is the same I, i've seen it across industries i've seen it across gender across age across ethnicity i think men and women and i know men and women communicate differently up in front of a crowd i think it's pretty much 50 50. women do have less confidence in general and that's an area where i specialize however it has to do more with speaking up in a meeting or taking credit or not being as perfectionistic. But if you give people the skills, I'd say men and women are fairly equal in the way they present. However, I will say that crowds are different. It's sometimes more fun to talk to a women, uh, all female audience because first of all, they're shoppers. If you're selling, you're going to get more sales from the women. And also they tend to be more interactive and participative speaking skills, I think it's pretty equal. You know, it's interesting that you say, uh, and for those that are listening on the radio, obviously, if you, if you, if you have a fear of communication, of speaking, uh, Diane DeResta is the go-to person. Now, I, I know, in fairness, that there are a lot of people who profess to be uh, a communication specialist, but your resume is just to die for it's a no no pun intended considering your book is knockout presentations but it's a knockout resume the Thank interesting you. thing that i think you bring is that ability to look uh at, at people where they are and carry them to the next level um uh, it's said it said may not be true it's kind of like the, the, the old statement, you know, it takes 30 days to develop a habit. And apparently people that have studied it say it takes far longer, but that's okay. We all tend to quote things that we've heard, but there is the statement that uh, public speaking is the second greatest fear that human beings have, death being number one. So what do you think it is about public speaking that makes it so challenging for a large part of our population? that we all get some butterflies. You and I are both professional speakers. We're both certified speaking professionals or CSPs. But you know when the stakes are higher, you get more nervous. If I suddenly got a main stage opportunity in front of a national, national Speakers Association, that to me is one of the most high stakes, yes. fear-inducing situations. And yet, I never give it two thoughts when I'm presenting to my clients. So. What makes people afraid? Here's what my, my personal experience has shown me. When I presentations, I started interviewing people anecdotally. And I'd ask them, well, why are you afraid? And they would say things like, well, 
what if I lose my train of thought or what if I trip or I don't want to look foolish? And when I looked at the answers, the common thread was fear of humiliation. And I totally understand that because after reading about the neuroscience, they've discovered that humiliation is one of the worst fears because of where it's recorded in the brain. And it really impacts people on a very deep, low level, emotional level, it's at the level of the amygdala, say, so to speak. So it, it's a real fear. No one wants to look bad. So what I do when I work with people is mindset and skill set. So here's what I've, I've discovered. When people are afraid of speaking, and I'm not talking about true phobias, but when people have the usual fear of speaking, it's because they're being self-centered. And I've said that to audiences, because it's all about me, myself, and I. In other words, what if I trip? What if I thought? So what that tells me is your mindset is living in the future, because you're imagining everything that could go wrong. What I aim to do with my coaching and speaking is get people in the present moment, because when you're present, then you're with now and you're connected, and you're engaged, and there's a relationship. And now, you're, they're not the enemy. You're connected, and I say to people, imagine they're a little fearful too. What can you do to make them feel comfortable? What can you do to give them a valuable experience? Get over yourself. It's not about you, it's about them. Now, those words sound pretty trite and pretty basic, and yet words are powerful because people have said to me when I've told them that, you know, when you said that, it really turned my thinking around, and it made me feel more confident. So it's really about how is your mindset. And then the second part is you do need the skills. One of the reasons both of us have confidence on the platform is because we've trained for so many years. Right. We know what to do. I specialize in breaking it down. What does confidence look like? What does it sound like? How do you speak the language of confidence? And then the next level is recovery strategies. What do you do when something goes wrong? <laughs> so for example, I, I asked an audience about this, and she said, what, one woman said, well, what if when I get up on the stage, I trip? Okay. What could you say? How about... I want you to know I've been practicing this entrance for weeks. Or, never let it be said, I don't know to ha how to make an entrance. What will happen is you'll get that comic relief. It breaks tension because the audience doesn't want you to fail. It feels uncomfortable. Right. And so when you don't take your laugh and they will never fault you. I heard a story about a woman who, I don't think they make half slips anymore, <laughs> but she was at the podium and in the middle of her speech, the elastic broke and her slip fell to her ankles. And she just looked around, slipped out of the slip, pushed it aside, and kept talking. That's a pro. You don't let what happens throw you. You just keep on going. Absolutely. I'll say this before we go to break. Uh, Diane, a year ago, I had, uh, I had back surgery. And so it was my first speech after kind of recovering and getting to a normal place. And for those of you that listen to the radio show, on a regular basis, you know that uh, I talk about ethics and why smart people make dumb, stupid choices. And I was there and did that. And so I walk in in an orange jumpsuit and handcuffs. And so I normally, I always have the handcuff key strategically placed. So I know exactly where it is. But on this, the first presentation following back surgery, I come in, I'm in the moment, hand, hands are cuffed in this orange jumpsuit, and I go to get the key and it's not in its strategic place. And it occurs to me, I never took it out of my pocket. And so I reach down, just swipe my pocket, realize in my left pocket inside of a jumpsuit is the handcuff key. So like the lady with the slip, I just did what I needed to do. I said, gentlemen, in this particular presentation, someone's gonna have to man up because you're going to have to reach inside my jumpsuit into my left pocket and pull out the key. And thank God someone in the audience holds up a handcuff key. And they said, I was in law enforcement 20 years ago and I've never not had one. 
So Whoa. there are times that, you know, God will protect you, but you have to be able to go with the flow. And speaking of that, it is time for a break. This is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio. My guest yeah. is Diane DeResta. She is the author of this incredible book, Knockout Presentations, How to Deliver Your Message with Power, Punch, and Pizzazz. You can find it on Amazon.com, and we will be back in just a moment. Stick with us. Hi, this is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio. We're back with segment two. My guest is Diane DeResta. She is the founder of DeResta Communications. And let me say this, if you've been listening in the first segment of our show, Diane is an incredible presenter. She is a certified speaking professional, but more important than that, and the programs that she does for uh, companies and associations literally worldwide, she also does coaching and she works with people to help them move past fear and into a performance state. And Diane, you know, one of the things that we have talked about is, and it's easy for us, is those public presentations. But I'm kind of curious, walk me through a little bit of what happens whenever you're coaching someone one-on-one -on -one to, if nothing more, enhance their presence in a company so that they have upward mobility. Well, that's a really important skill, what we call executive presence, because I often get caught where what happens is a leader reaches a level and they plateau because they either don't look, sound, or speak the, the part of a leader. And the, the this point, it's no longer what you know, it's how you present yourself, it's your influence, it's your followership, it's your leadership. And so that's where I come in. And a lot of times it has to do with a spoken word. And that is my mission in life. And, you know, when you ask, why do you think you're on this planet? I think it's to empower people through the spoken word because it's so powerful and it, it becomes your reality. So what I do is I, I get a, a sense and I assess where they are and where the disconnected video. And I also check back with their immediate manager to see how things are coming across. So here's an example. I was working with a woman who was a director and she was very smart with her material, but they weren't sure at this point whether she didn't really know or she didn't know how to present. And she was presenting to the president. So as I listened to her presentation, I said, your call to action is clear. I know what you want from me. I have no idea how you got that. started to backtrack and I worked through her presentation. And so it was like a, a web. It was interwoven. It didn't make sense. So I cut through the clutter, helped her to be simple and to really speak in terms of what that president expected. The good news was when she, she learned how to use simplicity as a communication tool, her, the president started asking tons of questions and she got her project approved. So it's better to say less, to be clear, to be on point and let the audience or the listener or the decision maker drill deep. That's a big mistake in a lot of organizations. People get caught in the weeds and I'm sure you've experienced that even from speakers on the stage. Don't delve in with details. Start with what's important to the listener frame it and then save that for the middle. When it, I think it's fascinating that you say, you know, people get caught in the weeds. I, I see lots of, especially in um, professional presentations that people feel like they need to impart all of these details. Um, I, I used to do a lot of continuing education courses for CPAs and oh my gosh, you know, you've got to quote the site, you've got to go through this. You've, I mean, it's like, really, this is, it would, it puts people to sleep. Absolutely. And I, and I wonder at times if it's because you feel like you need to be all knowing and therefore you've got to communicate this as opposed to what you just said, which is simplicity. I think that people who do what I call a data dump are coming from a very pure intention. They really believe that if I tell you everything I know in my head and I empty it, you will be so much more in, empowered and informed. And actually the reverse is true because 
because the brain just can't take all that data in. So less is more, and I show people how to do that. The other thing that gets people bogged down and boring is the numbers. And I've worked with not just CPAs, but people in retail. They have their reports and their SKUs, and they're reading the numbers. I can read an Excel sheet just as well as you can. What is the value you bring? Tell me the story about the numbers. When you look at all these numbers, don't tell me A is in, in stock, B is not, C is in stock. D, what's the story? We have 80% in stock and we need to reorder for 20%. Be simple, be clear. You know, you say what's the story. I have to assume, Diane, that part of um, the work that you do in coaching is helping people pull that story out mm -hmm. so that they're communicating stories, not data. Exactly. And uh, one of the things I do is I am an expert guest consultant for a boutique outplacement firm. And what they do is they repackage executives at the C level. Okay. And so they bring me in to do the video coaching interview skills. And it's often hard for them to do their personal branding. And so I say, when you're in an interview, there are three questions you absolutely must nail. Tell me about yourself. Why did you leave? And why should I hire you? So that's the core of where we work. And it's very hard down in the details. And remember, a branding statement is not your resume. It's you as a package of skills. So I, I, I'm very good at cutting down through the clutter and making it simple. So sometimes what I do is I say it into a tape and then I send it to them. <laughs> oh, nice. Nice. When, um, it's easy when it's someone else other than you. You can hear their story and help them to tell it. Absolutely. Well, you know, and I often will make the comment, you, you, you know, you can't tell the tallest tree in the forest if you're standing at the base of the trees. So in, in the world you live in, as a, as a professional communicator and, and as a communicator and coach for communication, easier for you to step outside and look down and remove the things that aren't getting that person to message. Absolutely. You know, and I need someone to help me because we're too close to ourselves and that becomes the big challenge and that's why you get a coach or a consultant to help you with that but right. it's so true and when you talk about that helicopter view another big challenge that I find since I work primarily in corporations is people have difficulty selling their ideas to senior management for the same reason they don't think the way they think and they talk too much process and they talk too much detail tell them what it is that you want how is it going to benefit them what's our return on investment Think the way your audience thinks. You know, it, it's, it's kind of fascinating. I was listening the other day to a story. It, of course, it goes back to um, a comment that was made about Steve Jobs in the old, old days, whenever there was uh, uh, iDVD, the, the computer was going to burn a DVD. That, of course, is the days when we had DVDs. Now it's just downloaded or we can easily get it on YouTube. But, um, but I thought it was fascinating because the people that were going to communicate to him had all of this process down and he walks in the room up to the whiteboard. He said, okay, here's the file that was recorded. Drag it over here to this little circle that says IDVD, hit a thing that says burn, and that's all, and walks out of the room. He knew at a high level what he wanted. Didn't care about the process. Give me the outcome. You worry about the process, not my job. Absolutely. Mistake in selling. A lot of times people who sell for a living are so in love with the product and they talk about the product and the features. And you know what? We don't buy features. We buy the outcomes. How are we going to benefit from this? Again, it, it goes back to understanding who you're talking to and the people who can be more flexible and shift gears and communicate in a different way to each person is going to be more successful as a communicator. Now, in, in the communication world, and, and perhaps we'll, we'll sp spend a little bit of time with this in, in this segment, um, because your book, Knockout Presentations, is, is used in business communication courses, um, do you find, and you may not have an opportunity to coach many millennials, I don't know, but do you find that there is a difference with um, the baby boom Gen X versus the millennial group that seems to be easily connected with texting and, you know, 
non-detailed communication. It's just quick and easy, and, 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 and it is a different approach. Is it, is it harder for that group to be able to communicate live and in person? That, you know, it really depends on the group, but millennials are different from baby boomers. Absolutely. That they're at a disadvantage because they grew up with the technology and what they're missing is those interpersonal skills, but more importantly, the value. I don't know that they really truly understand the impact of that face-to-face. -face. So that's something that needs to, to be worked with. Some millennials who took to it very well and, and love standing up and, and really improved. I've had others that have been difficult, but I will tell you something. I know somebody who is creating this coaching program by text and he's testing it out and he has some coaches working for him because he knows that's how millennials like to be coached. Do I think it's effective? But he's smart to know who his audience is and to be in the forefront with that. Oh, that's so, fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's going to be a learning curve for both boomers and millennials. But you know, with four generations in the workplace, we do have our challenges cut out for us. Yeah, it, it, is, it is a different time that we live uh, because you and I, I certainly am a baby boomer. I can sit back and I can look at uh, my parents who are still living and their perspective on the world, my perspective on the world, my children's perspective on the world. And of course, my grandchildren are sitting there and, you know, to them, the idea of just picking up a, uh, a phone or an iPad and texting and sending a message is, is sweet and beautiful, but yet it's intuitive to them. It does cause, however, some challenges in terms of carrying on that face-to-face -face dialogue. Yes. So what's intuitive is the technology, but not the interpersonal. So here's where both generations can be helpful because I go to my and say, I can't figure this out on my cell phone. They go, look, 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 and it's done. <laughs> it's in the DNA. <laughs> we have to learn it. it. They're just born with it. Absolutely. There is no question about it. And, and you know what? I, I do want to say that I think it is different and we are now communicate both analog and digital and that's the challenge for us to make that transition I, I think video is going to continue to be a very strong form of communication YouTube is the number two search engine so we all need to do this and do it well absolutely and with that said since we're in the digital world at this point in time we're going to take a quick break this is chuck gallagher with straight talk radio my guest diane deresta is the author of knockout presentations how to deliver your message with power punch and pizzazz and the ebook give fear the finger you can find all of that information at deresta.com that is d-i-r-e-s-t-a.com she has a unique ability to get to the core of the message and translate complexity into simplicity. Stick with us. We'll be back with our third segment in just a moment. Well, we're back. This is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio, and I am thrilled to have Diane DeResta as my guest. Uh, Diane is the founder and CEO of DeResta Communications, but most importantly, she is superb at being able to work with people who might find uh, communication as a challenge. Now, when I say communication is a challenge, that could be one-on-one -on -one communication. I want to communicate to the CEO why I should be elevated to the next level or why my project should be chosen or that communication to a board uh, uh, group or to a larger audience. Um, and Diane, you and I, we, we've had a little bit of opportunity here to talk about the, the difference in generations and the, the need to connect on technology. Right. Now, I, I don't know your experience, and I'm going to find this out in a second, but I know that um, uh, I, I have been given the task of doing uh, webinar presentations uh, to uh, a, a particularly large client, and it's just not convenient to be able to go out and, 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 and you know, travel across the country and, and meet everybody face to face. But I have to tell you, these webinars are killer because one, you got to keep the energy up, and number two, you have this, this series of slides, and it just strikes me as you don't get to see the face, you don't get to see the emotion. It's just a challenge. But 
It also happens to be highly effective if we can keep people engaged in the webinar and not sitting there, you know, checking their cell phones and putting you on mute and going someplace else and knowing that all they're doing is just checking, checking off a little box that says, yes, I attended. Now, first, before we talk about your webinar, talk to us a little bit about just electronic communications in general and, and some of the things that you're finding or that we need to know to improve our skills. Well, you know, I said earlier that we are moving from an analog to a digital world and we need to learn communication in the digital world and we didn't grow up with it. So there are techniques, there are, there are pluses and minuses of both. Here is my true belief, and I will put a stake in the ground. Technology will never replace personality face-to-face, -face. never. And they were saying that years ago that it would replace meetings and we have meetings, people, the reason is people don't want just an online meeting because they want to go and shake hands. They want to meet the top people, relationships. So ideally that's first, but there are going to be times when that's not the case and you do need to go digital. So digital has a great opportunity to scale what you do, meaning that you can reach so many more people. And one of my goals is I want to reach people internationally and webinars are a great way to do that. The other benefit is because you duplicate yourself, you up. You can send a recording and still get your message out, which is so important. But the challenge becomes, as you said, it's a bunch of slides. Well, people who stand up and simply read the slide, same thing in a webinar. So it's the same skills, but reduced or tailored to that, that medium. So for example, engagement is better when they don't see you. So ideally, you can use Zoom as a slideshow, and then you have the video component. You can use tools like Adobe Connect, which is more expensive, and it has more. But that, idea, I think, is ideal. I love seeing you. It, it just helps the relationship. And I think it helps people. When they see you, it builds that no trust like. But that's the you know, With your, your webinar, the first thing that you want to do is you want to make sure that you're grabbing attention, that you're setting the stage, and you're positioning the way that you're going to work together. You want to have some kind of engagement. So whether it's polling, where you can ask a question, whether you are showing different slides, you want to have momentum. Sometimes people talk too long on a slide. So continual movement. I have a short attention span. And by the way, research shows that a goldfish has a longer attention span than humans by, by one second. <laughs> Seriously, I, I think it, if, if our attention span is seven seconds, theirs is eight. So, oh, my goodness. So it, it's, it's really pathetic, but it's true. That's what we're dealing with. So more slides. So the opposite is true in digital. When you're live, we'll say, don't have so many slides in your deck. Have fewer. But when you're doing a webinar, it actually helps if you have more slides with less. One word here, a picture here, quick movement, because otherwise people get distracted. And what do they do? They go on their email. We all do it. Right. So you want to get attention. You also might want to build in some kind of quiz or content you have to wait to hear for. Maybe it's a key word so that you keep their engagement throughout. So those are a few of the things. You also engage with tonality. So if you speak at the same level on every slide, they'll tune out. So use your voice. Tell more stories. That is what engages people. Start with a story. Build little vignettes or stories or anecdotes throughout. Have visuals that require them to follow you in terms of a build. Clip one, clip two, clip three. So there are a number of things that you can do, but the key thing is make sure it's hitting what's important to them and make sure that there's some kind of engagement. You know, it's interesting, Diane, that you talk about that because one of the things that I found in doing the webinars that I've been doing, and by the way, you just gave me great information, so I want to thank you because the webinar, the, the slides are the same as when I do a live presentation. Aha, so first quick takeaway for me was change the slides, have more of them, 
that are moving more quickly, which quite frankly didn't cross my mind, and I, I appreciate that. But I found that in the webinars that I do, I have to literally stand up with my headphone on and I have to have my little clicker because if I'm moving, I have been able to, 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 to know that the energy is higher and more than likely we're getting better engagement than when I'm sitting in a stationary position and yes. I can't see anyone on the other side. Absolutely. And that's the big challenge. So if you don't have video, you can stand and you'll have so much more energy. If I stand right now, my head's going to get cut off. So I, I need that true. And the biggest complaint I get in organizations is teleconferences. So you have no visual. Right. And you're absolutely right. And there's not an easy answer to that because we're visual people and you're right. losing more than half the message, which is body language. So what I say to people is send the handouts in advance. advance. Make sure that you're checking in periodically. Right. You have people in front of you because usually you have a live audience and then you have people calling in remotely. Stop and check in with your remote sites. Make sure you use the pause. And this is a big issue for so many of us. Master the pause. Here's what often happens. So are there any questions? Okay, now on the next slide, you've got to give those beats, three beats, five beats. Give people a moment because they need to formulate a thought and encourage the thinking by posing a question, by saying, all right, before we move on to the next section of this webinar, one of the questions that comes up for you, and as you do that, you're giving people that thinking time. Makes sense. Diane, uh, I notice on your website, and by the way, for those of you that are listening on the radio, not seeing this on YouTube, it is Diresta, D-I-R-E-S-T-A dot com. I hope my Southern accent is not hindering you from being able to actually find Diresta, D-I-R-E-S-T-A dot com. But on your website, there is a place where a person, if they don't have the uh, time or capacity to engage you as direct, for direct coaching, you have a webinar series. It's how to give a knockout presentation webinar series. And I noticed there is um, a comment on the website that says the online webinar sessions had a true impact in building structure in my presentation and gave me confidence in my role as a public speaker. And that's powerful for someone to say who has used the webinar series and found value and improved their skills. Tell us a little bit about how you created that and, 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 and the people that are, are participating in the webinar program. I created that live and then I recorded it. So I have kept the live interaction on there. So if someone asked a question, you'll hear it on there, but I, created it in three modules. The first is the delivery technique. So this is where I talk about what does confidence look like, sound like, and how do you speak the language of confidence so that it's demystified because there are certain things you can do no matter how nervous you are. If you assume the posture of confidence, if you use the voice of confidence, if you eliminate certain weak or wimpy words, you will be perceived as confident. And it's interesting that perception becomes the reality. So the good news is when you're starting out, or even if you're not starting out and you're more seasoned, but you're still nervous, when you learn these techniques, you can manage perception. So it gives you a real sense of control. So that's the whole delivery part. The second, and by the way, it's an hour. The okay. second uh, webinar part of this series is also an hour. And that is to get dedicated to organization, which is so key. People think, that it's all about delivery. But here's what I've discovered, and you know this too, Chuck, as a professional speaker. Delivery sits on structure. It's like the foundation of it. And often when I coach people, I ask them to come in for more than one session. I had someone who was a financial advisor, very successful, and she was giving a talk her call and she said, well, no, I'm going to write it up. I'm pretty good with writing my own content. I just want you to help me deliver it. So she comes in for the delivery and I'm seeing all these issues around the structure. And had she worked with me, we would have built a stronger foundation. So we, I give you templates. I show you a 
seven-part series, which I call listener-centered communication, that helps you get right into the mind of a listener quickly. We talk about how to analyze and profile your listeners because people don't spend time doing that. They don't think about it. They think more about, what do I want to say? So you actually are taken step-by-step step through a persuasive or an informative model. And then the third part of the webinar series, which is also an hour, is Q&A. So okay. now you've structured your message, you've delivered it, and you're opening it up. And here's where people can quickly derail kind of skill. It's more about facilitation. It's about managing relationships. It's about timing. So I show you techniques on when you have a bigger group, how do you handle that? manage the Q&A and keep control? And what do you do when you meet that audience from hell? In other words, those difficult personalities, those hostile questions. I get for not only identifying the nitpicker, the whiner, the, the expert, the know-it-all, but how to deal with all of those people. So it's a lot of content in a three-hour series. Well, the one thing that, again, struck me, and before we go to our, our last break, the one thing that really struck me is, um, and I think it's wonderful, in fact, that you recorded a live session and that you've been able to then create the webinar from that. Because, you know, frankly, Diane, you, you said this earlier, and, and we talked about this in our, in our second segment, is we have to be able to embrace the digital world and not everyone can get your coaching. If, if there was a significant issue and you were busy tomorrow and right. someone needed that structure, it's a way to connect. So for the audience, let me say to you, it is Duresta.com, Duresta.com. And let me make sure if you go under the tab services, to webinars, you will immediately find this. So Duresta.com, go to the tab service and webinars, and you'll be able to find the series, how to give a knockout presentation webinar series. This is Chuck Gallagher. It is Straight Talk Radio. My guest is Diane Duresta. She is the founder of Duresta Communications and the author of Knockout Presentations, How to Deliver Your Message with Power Punch and Pizzazz, the three Ps. And we will be back for our last segment with Diane in just a moment. Stick with us. Hi, this is Chuck Gallagher, and it is Straight Talk Radio. And this, this whole show has been about communication. Of course, for those of you that are listening on the radio, you're hearing all of this auditorily. Uh, some of you, however, will be watching this show on YouTube. My guest, Diane Duresta, uh, the founder of Duresta Communications, the author of Knockout Presentations, which you, by the way, can find on Amazon.com, and the ebook Give Fear the Finger, which I don't know who helps you with your titles or if you were just naturally that creative, but I love it. You can find that at Duresta.com, D-I-R-E-S-T-A.com. And Diane, we were talking about uh, in this whole thing of communication, the last segment, your webinar series, but one of the things that you mentioned in the webinar series, I think it's the first segment, was talking about what confidence looks like. How does it sound? What is the language of confidence? And at least my perception is that in many cases, the reason peer, people fear uh, communication or public speaking is they aren't confident and they fear they will be humiliated. And as you said, that paralyzes them. So let's talk about what confidence looks like and the language of confidence. Well, the good news, Chuck, is it's little things that make the greatest impact. So making a few adjustments can have a huge impact on how you're perceived. And as you're perceived more confidently, you start to feel more confident. Or I should say, as you're perceived as being more confident and positive, you start to feel that. So one example is if you put your shoulders forward and then you put them back, there's a big difference in how you hold yourself how you start to feel. So people need to realize that there's always that mind-body connection. So when you start to feel uncomfortable, your body starts to go into that uncomfortable or nervous stance. Right. right. Slouching. So right away, I show people how to get into position. 
And because a lot of people I work with are at meetings, I show them a power position, which is both feet flat on the floor. And I'll see if I can switch this a little bit. I don't know if you can see it. But hands on the table, and you're leaning in at a 15-degree angle. Okay. And what that does is it creates the impression of confidence. It is a listening position, and it makes like you are present and take on the world. But the other benefit of that is it grounds you. And the big issue that people have when they start is they don't know how to ground themselves all out. Hmm. So there are two things I recommend. Number one, ground yourself with your stance whether you're sitting or standing. And the second thing is memorize your opening line. So many times, people, oh, good morning. Yeah, um, well, what, what I want to talk about, well, I, and it's, it's me stop. I want you to memorize your line, and I want you to say it without, so um, no to stammering, stay, say it. And that makes such a difference. So it's those little things. Again, it's all about preparation, position, opening line. So that's one of the things. But if you look at body language, there's been a lot of study on how language communicates. It either communicates weakness or it communicates strength. Now, as we're watching the debates, you can see that. I don't want to comment on any one person, but I do have to say I anything I say has to do with presentation sure. and not politics. Right. But there are some presenters that communicate weakness and some that communicate strength. And it's all in their body language. It's in their voice. It's in their language. So another important thing to think about is your voice is a barometer of the emotions. And this comes from my speech pathology background. So when you hear someone on the phone, you, you know right away what their emotional state is. You sound tired. You sound depressed. You sound chipper you can hear it in the voice. The good right. news is you can create the impression you want. And I call it, when I've worked with those executives in outplacement, the senior executives who need to go out and interview, sometimes they tend to be monotone or low energy. And I tell them, this is a performance and you need to be on. So it's as if you're on stage and the curtain opens. It's showtime. So you're there. And your energy has to be high. Flip the switch. We can do that by knowing what that state is. So it's projecting a little bit more energy than you normally would. Speaking a little bit louder. Leaning forward. Getting into the state. It's important. You know, so Diane, when you talk about that, that is that that absolutely is so true. Is being in the state, knowing what that state feels like. And, and I have to assume, and tell me now if I'm incorrect, I do not coach on presentations. So this is your area, certainly not mine. But I, I have to assume that once you can teach someone the things that they need to do, how they need to be grounded, how they need to physically position themselves, how they need to have that opening statement. Then after that, it becomes a function of practicing it. So it becomes easy to reconnect with what that state feels like. Yes. And people need to be in their bodies. So again, going back to future thinking, when you're in a state of anxiety and nervousness, your, your mind is racing and you're thinking in the future of all the things that can go wrong, you need to stop, ground, and be here now. Be present. And then forget it. Just be yourself. Talk from your knowledge base. And I tell people, don't worry if you don't say it the way you practice it. They don't know. Don't worry right. if you've got something. Don't be present. That they can feel. Because there's always an exchange of energy between an audience and a speaker. Right. That's, that is so true. And we're, we're, we're getting close to the end of the show, but I, I do want to say this to you and, and get your opinion. It was, um, it was very interesting when I began my speaking career. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I had a, a lady who runs a speaker's bureau, Betty Garrett, and a friend of hers meet with me and, and listen to the presentation. And uh, they said, well, you need a speech coach. And Diane, I have to admit, I was a bit offended because I thought, well, you know, I, I can deliver. I'm not uncomfortable in front of an audience. And they said, you don't need the coach so much for 
the, the physicalness of you being in front of an audience, you need to coach because you're making it too analytical and there's not enough emotion. Yeah. People want to feel something. It's not about the data dump, Chuck. It's about how they feel when they leave that. Did they get something that was meaningful that they can carry with them? And I assume that's probably one of the key components for someone to be an effective communicator is how did you make the other person feel? Absolutely. So if you could make them laugh, if you could make them feel something, if you can make them think and have an experience and recall, if you can connect the dots for them, that's what they'll remember, not the statistic, although the statistic could be important. So yeah, and that's why you want to get people to tell their stories even if they're short, because that's what people will remember. That's what they will relate to. And by the way, self-disclosure is a very powerful skill. Because when you talk about your mistakes, like when I was talking about freshman year of college and my shoulders are shaking in my public speaking class, right. people can relate to that because then they say, oh, okay, well, she's not perfect. And so when I coach people, I say, I don't function in the rooms. For two reasons. One is you can't achieve it on earth. <laughs> but two, people hate a perfect person. Right. But they do like someone who's human. So it's yourself by telling stories and, and reaching out and connecting. I want to say this. Um, on the radio here on Straight Talk Radio, we have had Diane DeResta. Diane, you have been wonderful and so much, so much incredible information. Um, if you're running a company, if you're involved with the company and you understand that if you want to take that company to the next level, it really is a function of how effective you're going to be able to communicate that message. Diane DeResta is the person that you need to talk with because she can take you to the next level. You can find her at Deresta, D-I-R-E-S-T-A.com, Deresta.com. If you go there, you can pick up her ebook, Give Fear the Finger. Now, I would hold that up, but I don't know. People may not like that too much. And of course, her just rave, re reviewed book on Amazon is Knockout Presentations, How to Deliver Your Message with Power, Punch, and Pizzazz. If you're sitting there thinking to yourself, I need this, you know, I I'm going on a job interview and I need to be really effective on the job interview or I am uh, pitching uh, uh, something within my company that is critically important. Either go to Diane and talk with her to, to seek out her coaching or you can check out her webinar series, which is again, received rave reviews and easy enough for anybody that's listening to the show to pick up on. So Diane, I wanna again, I wanna say thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time to help us through this process. Uh, I really do appreciate it. You, uh, you are an incredible presenter, but more importantly, your purpose, you said that you know, being here on earth is to help people communicate better and you are living that purpose. Thank and you. I believe that is an incredibly important thing for any of us to do. Thank you so much, Chuck. And also, people can visit my YouTube channel. It's youtube.com forward slash Diane DeResta. And I have over 100 videos there for people as well. Awesome. That is a great, great takeaway. Now, this is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio. And as I always say, as I end the show, every choice we make in life has a consequence. In this show, if you are challenged with communication, make the choice to go to deresta.com. Again, this is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio. Thanks for tuning in and tune in next week for another wonderful guest. We will talk with you soon. Bye-bye.